All right, here comes question three. Further to your talk about the patient with the damaged frontal lobes, would it actually be possible in your sessions following the operation to bring him back to a less damaged state by a psychoanalysis approach? Was he able to work through his confabulations to recover more of the reality he had before the operation? How treatable is the loss due to the physical damage? Now, of course, um, we're talking about two different types of treatment. There's the physical damage, um, which is treated surgically um, and then or to the extent that it's treatable at all. Um, the loss of tissue, once it's lost, um, there's nothing that's going to replace it. Certainly nothing in the current therapeutic armamentarium we have. Um, but as regards the mental consequences of that loss of tissue, um, then we're talking about psychological treatments. And many people assume because tissue is lost, um, the, the, the psychological function that that tissue performs is irrevocably lost, uh, just as much as the tissue is. But that's really not the case. The reason for this is that psychological functions don't have a one-to-one -one relationship um, with anatomy. So it's very seldom the case that one nucleus or one cortical region uh, performs a whole mental function in the way that we categorize mental functions. In fact, uh, each of these brain structures contributes a component function to the complex functional systems that we, uh, overarching functional systems that we, that we think of as, as, as psychological faculties. So it is, for example, with memory, which brings us to the case uh, in, in, in point. Um, the memory disorder that is confabulation that is not a direct simple consequence of the loss of an anti-confabulation module you know, in the brain. Um, there's not a module in the brain which performs the function of reality testing and then when you lose it, the patient loses their sense of reality or their ability to monitor reality and uh, then they, they confabulate. The confabulation is a complex psychological phenomenon um, which has multiple component parts in it. Um, and this, as I say, uh, all the more uh, uh, applies to memory as a whole. The confabulation is uh, just one part of the multiple disorders of memory reflecting the multiplicity of some components that make up um, human memory. So, uh, you know, against all of that sort of abstract uh, uh, general theoretical background, it then becomes very important to understand what is the psychological structure of the disorder that you're treating. That is to say, what is the psychological mechanism underlying the structure? It's not a simple matter of a piece of a jigsaw puzzle missing. It's a matter of a piece of a jigsaw puzzle missing, which then results in complex dynamic changes in the functional system um, at, 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 at issue. And there may be things in, that, in those complex dynamic changes in the functional system that you can intervene in, um, even though you can't uh, change the, the underlying jigsaw puzzle. In the case of confabulation, uh, what we found from careful study of these patients is that they lose specific memory search and memory monitoring uh, mechanisms. But the confabulation is not a direct, a simple consequence of that loss. The con uh, the, when you lose these veridical, reality-oriented, that is to say accurate, precise uh, memory mechanisms, that releases from inhibition um, more affectively driven, more wishful, um, more egocentric um, memory systems, um, more childish memory systems, if you will. So the way that a little child, um, as you, most of you will know, uh, a child doesn't necessarily represent things the way that they really happened. The child represents things uh, if, if, uh, much more frequently than the adult, uh, the way that they think it happens or the way that they would like it to have happened. No, no, you didn't take it away or no, he didn't win the race or whatever the case may be, even though veridically they clearly did. Uh, a thing, the thing that the child doesn't want did happen but the child doesn't remember it that way because they don't want to remember it that way. Those, those more mature memory mechanisms, those more accurate and precise and objective memory mechanisms are lost in these adult patients, and this releases other mechanisms which are normally over, overridden by the, by the more mature mechanisms, and then you have this more emotionally driven, more uh, wishful uh, type of remembering, which is what we call confabulation. It's a core mechanism of confabulation. So... Whether or not you can treat it uh, depends on whether or not you understand what you're dealing with. 
If you don't realize that that's the mechanism of confabulation, you would be treating it in the wrong way. You just, by rote, trying to get the person to remember better is never going to change a mechanism that is in fact emotional and motivational. Uh, you, the treatment needs to be emotional and motivational. That brings us to the final precise question that's being asked here, which is that can you actually treat these patients psychologically? Does it make a difference? Um, I won't speak about that one individual patient um, uh, because, in fact, in his case, well, I can say one or two things about him, but the fact is, sadly, he died, and so we didn't have a long um, follow-up with him. But we've treated many such patients, and uh, these are the general principles that we find. When you interpret psychologically, when you help the patient to understand that there's something that they don't want to recognize, uh, and that they are rather misrepresenting things this way because it suits them better. When you help the patient to see that that's what's going on, you do indeed reduce or, in, or remove confabulations. If you do, it's not easy, but if you form a, a good therapeutic alliance with the patient, the patient comes to trust you, you empathize with the patient, you get to a point where the two of you can face a painful emotional reality, uh, this uh, removes the confabulation. Now, that is proof of concept. Uh, the very fact that you can uh, remove confabulations um, in the way that I've just described uh, is the proof of the concept that I started outlining uh, in the preliminary remarks I made now in response to this question, which is that they are psychodynamic phenomena, even though they have a, a, a simple uh, organic cause. However, and this is the last thing I must say, the fact that we are able to remove the confabulations is uh, it's not permanent. You can remove the confabulations during the session. You can have the patient absolutely lucid during the session. But when the session ends, you come back to the next session, the patient's confabulating again. So we have not yet uh, any um, a, a, a good reason to believe that we can have sustained gains um, with the treatment of confabulation. Um, uh, perhaps, in fact, I should say one further thing, which is that uh, many cases of confabulation, most cases of confabulation, there is a large degree of spontaneous recovery anyway, <clears throat> as the patient. You know, reality is reality, and um, uh, misconstruing things doesn't really work, and so there's increasing um, uh, um, counter-evidence and uh, increasingly more mature, that is to say, more viable ways um, of dealing with feelings that these patients, uh, that they develop uh, all by themselves. But that's not always the case, and there certainly are many cases where there's chronic confabulation. Even just understanding, for the family to understand what the confabulation is all about, uh, how it works, um, enables them to, uh, to create a much more helpful environment for the patient. But I think I've said enough in response to that question. Thanks.